We are Gold Ivy. Our mission is to empower you to own and unleash your truth. Stories of resiliency are gold and ivy grows in hard places. Those hard places are what creates space for light to shine through. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. Brooke, what do you think everyone wants more of? Energy. What do you think most people are hoping to come out of 2023 with? Mm, feel more confident, be an example for others, actually have the self-discipline to take care of themselves. Yes, exactly. Because we hear the need for it and we want to help you get in the best shape of your life, we created Move with Gold Ivy, our virtual workout platform. Our dream has been to create accessible, affordable, and effective workouts that you can do anytime, anywhere, designed to hold you accountable and get you the results you need. You can pick any workout you want at any time, but if you do want a plan that alternates muscle groups and leaves your body feeling energized and strong, we have a weekly plan that you can follow to take the guesswork out. It's easy to navigate and packed with all kinds of workouts that will help you strengthen, trim, pump up, tone, energize, de-stress, all of the things we want our body to feel. It's within MOVE. Don't forget to mention the resources we offer. As a member of Move with Gold Ivy, you'll be a part of our exclusive Ivy League community where we share our top wellness resources on things like meal planning, gut health hacks, time management, and more. And because you listen to the Ivy Unleashed podcast, we want to offer you all of this for only $20 a month, cheaper than any monthly membership you'll find. Not only that, you'll get a free trial week to test it out. And if you need more incentive to start prioritizing you, here's our favorite part. Your movement matters. Each month, 10% of your membership will be donated to support the mental health of those in need. So head on over to goldivyhealthcode.com slash move or find the link within the show notes of this episode and sign up today. Stop putting yourself in the back burner. Snag your spot and reap the benefits that you deserve to feel this year. It's your time. Move for your health, move for your confidence, move for your mental clarity, move with Gold Ivy. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. This is the Earth Day episode you've all been waiting for. We're wearing green. (laughs) I'm wearing green. Brooke's wearing green. We're going green. We're really excited. And we have the perfect guests to talk everything Earth Day with us. Welcome back to Ivy Unleashed, Sonia Eklund. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Uh, Sonia's been on the podcast multiple times. You all love her. We love her. And like Andrea said, she's the perfect person to talk about why we need to care because our health is impacted by the environment and vice versa. And we're really going to get into it. We're going to get, we're going to ask Sonia the questions we know all of y'all are wondering because we're wondering too. And for those who are new and aren't familiar with Sonia, she is a national board certified health and wellness coach, a yoga teacher, a financial wellness professional, a low impact minimalist, a debt-free lifestyler, a houseplant enthusiast. Yes, she is. And today her role as our climate optimist. Sonia, what in the world is a climate optimist? Let's start there. (laughs) Yes, definitely. So Climate optimism is a term that has been around for a little while now. And I I think that what's really great about the term is that it contrasts a lot of the really like negative catastrophic thinking that's so easy to spiral into when we start thinking about a problem as big as climate change. And so climate optimism is not about ignoring what has been lost. It's not about ignoring the scope of the issue. It's about recognizing that it's not too late. It's not too late to help fix this problem. It's not too late to prevent things from getting worse. And it's really about recognizing that we are making progress. Those of us who are working actively on, you know, improving climate change and really helping to slow down the negative effects of climate change are seeing progress. And it's really just a term that helps recognize that there is progress to be made and there is hope around this whole topic. I love that. I feel like optimism is great for any topic, right? And to know that your efforts are making a difference is so important. So like you said, you don't lose hope. I think that's a big reason why people avoid this topic because they feel like, what's the point? What is my little tiny world, my little tiny house going to do to impact the entire 
world or the entire climate. So I, I really want to talk about that, right? Because we do make a difference. We do make a difference in what we do, how we act, the practices that we have. And so we definitely want to get into that. You know, we're a health and wellness podcast. And so a big thing we want to talk about is how we, with our health, impact the environment and vice versa, which I know is a huge topic to cover. <laughs> but when you think about that, Sonia, what's kind of like the first thing that comes to mind on how the environment impacts our health and, and vice versa? So I think the first thing to acknowledge is that there is no separating those two things. Like we live here, this is our home. And there's a really powerful quote that says, we are both responsible for and the victims of our own pollution. And that is a, a really, really scary and sad sentence if you really stop and think about what that means. Um, and what I think it means is that there's just this inextricable link between our emotional well being, our mental well being, our physical well being, our financial well being. Everything about who we are is linked to the health of the planet. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that, like, we can be hopeful about this, but this is a terrifying problem, right? Like it is scary, it is catastrophic, and it is really frightening when you really start to think about this. And the reason why so many people shut down is because there is this link between what's happening with climate change and our emotional well being. It becomes overwhelming, it becomes terrifying to really think about it and really understand the scope of the issue. But what I think that it means when something is so emotional and when there's so much emotion and so much tension surrounding an issue is that it means it matters, right? It means that it's worth fighting for. It means that it's not something we should give up on. It means that it's important. And so I think that when we think about the link between our own health and well-being and the health of the earth, the reason why it feels so big and so catastrophic is because it's totally connected. So let's dive into that even more because I know with my healing journey, when I became familiar with different products, right? Non-toxic living is this mm -hmm. term that we see everywhere. And for me, it was, it still is, is extremely important because I learned our skin is our biggest organ and what we're putting on our body. And then when you heat up food and plastic and the chemicals from that, right? So I became super aware of these products, this way of living is affecting my health. And that empowered me to do something in return that was also helping the earth. And it, like mm -hmm. you said, it's all interconnected. So let's kind of talk our audience through really why they need to care, why this is so interconnected with our health and the earth. Yeah. I think there are a lot of different reasons why we should care. And I think that one of the things that each individual person needs to do is figure out what value this issue speaks to in them, right? Like this is so connected to our emotional health, our physical health, our financial health, everything like that. And so it's really important that somebody finds a value that they can connect back to the planet. So Brooke, you just mentioned like your physical health is your value. It's the reason why you started to care about environmentalism, right? Andrea, what's the value of yours? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> a big value of mine is my kids being safe and healthy. I love that. How do you think that's connected to the environment itself? Mm, I mean, I go right to chemicals too, like thinking of what's going into their body. I also think about their waste, right? Like what they're, they're getting all these toys they're being gifted all these things. And then I either want to throw them in the trash or give them to somebody else. And so it just perpetuates the cycle of this waste on the planet. And that's something I, I definitely worry about. And I wonder like our impact on the environment with how much stuff and junk that comes into my home. Yeah. So I hear two things in there. One reason why you could connect to this issue and why you could care would be the safety of your kids, right? Like we are the last generation that can really make a pretty significant impact um, before this issue does become catastrophic for future generations. And so in the interest of your kids getting to live out a happy and healthy life, it's really important that we take action today, right? That we start to care today. And then I also heard in there that there's a lot related to um, consumerism, 
you know, and making sure that you are not over consuming and that you're being mindful of the impact that your consumption has. And that's an amazing reason to care. So I think that what we can really think about is when we get each individual person to start thinking about their own value systems and the the things that feel most important to them, we can always find a connection back to how it impacts the earth and how the earth in turn impacts us. Yeah. And I think people don't take the time to think about that link, right? They think about how they have to change their complete lifestyle and how inconvenient that is. And why would I add one more thing to my plate when my blueprint really, there's no way this matters. Yeah. And I think that a really unfortunate consequence of the way that we live in this country is that we kind of take on this whole rugged individualism thing, right? Like we as Americans, and especially living as white Americans, are very enmeshed in this whole idea of doing things yourself and, you know, making your own way and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And those concepts are damaging for so many reasons, but they do not work well when we're thinking about collective change. And when we're thinking about making sure that everybody has access to the resources that we all need and the resources that we all draw from the earth. And so I think it's really important to start thinking about like that the inconvenience um, factor is really big for a lot of people. It seems like it's going to be hard to make these changes. And it seems like it's going to be frustrating to have to adjust your lifestyle. Um, And I think to that, I say two different things. One, The fact that your life has not been impacted by climate change is a direct reflection of privilege. And that doesn't need to be a judgment. It's just a fact that if you actually can say that your lifestyle has not been impacted by climate change in the year 2023, you are incredibly privileged. And there are people all over the country and the planet that have been seeing and dealing firsthand with the destruction of our own choices for decades. And so that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is this is an opportunity to start to get really clear on understanding and recognizing how linked we all are as people, right? Regardless of race and socioeconomic status and age and anything else, we all need to care about this issue because each and every person on this planet calls this place home. Right. And it's in our collective best interest to really start working together to ensure that we can continue to call this place home. Yeah, I love that you called out those that aren't affected by it as privilege. I think until you're touched by it, you don't really understand the severity of it. You know, I think about my journey and I didn't care about non-toxic products. I cared about what's cheap. I am a post-college kid, you know, and It wasn't until I had to heal myself that I had to educate myself and I was touched by it. So for those that haven't been touched by it, which is probably a lot of us listening, will you just talk Mm -hmm. about some of the effects that people all over the world are seeing just to kind of get a grasp on the severity of the issue? Yeah, 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 for sure. So I think that first of all, it's really important to acknowledge that I, as a cisgendered white woman, I'm talking about a burden that people of color have been carrying for a very, very long time. And so I think it's really important to just recognize that I'm not an expert on this topic. And I do think that while I am talking about this topic, part of my role is to make sure that I'm amplifying the voices of other people who have been doing this work for much longer than I have, as well as to raise awareness around the connection between environmental racism and injustice and climate change, because I think that that's new information for a lot of people, right? Like a lot of people have started to access this movement through non-toxic living or through like recognizing that maybe they don't want to expose themselves to certain environmental toxins. And that's amazing and wonderful. And it's again, it's connecting back to your value system and what's speaking to you at the time. But I do think it's important to just recognize that like lots of people have been victims of pollution and exposed to things that we would not want to be exposed to for many, many centuries. And a lot of those people are people of color. So um, I think that helping people recognize the way that different systems of oppression kind of connect to the climate crisis and how that continues to marginalize people of color is really important to recognize. And more directly in answer to your question, 
you know, a person's ability to engage in like a low impact lifestyle or choose to purchase like non-toxic products is largely contingent on something called social determinants of health. Um, And the actual definition of that term are conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health and quality of life risks and outcomes. Um, So that's a definition that comes from the CDC. And basically, in more practical terms, it's like where you live, how safe your community is, what your economic situation looks like, how socially supported you are, the kind of like access to education you have, access to healthcare access to respectful treatment within the healthcare system, safe drinking water, access to food, like all of these things um, contribute to both health inequities, but also contribute to the climate crisis. So those are some of the examples of things that people who have been more directly impacted by the climate crisis have probably experienced, right? Like access to safe drinking water is a great example of this. Um, We see people even in affluent communities like Recently in Philadelphia, there was um, an incident that left the water unsafe to drink. We've seen this, of course, in Flint, Michigan, and in all kinds of places all across the country where people are you know, not able to access something as simple as drinking water, right? And um, we also see people losing their communities, losing their homes, losing their schools because of catastrophic storm, right? And Catastrophic storms have been happening forever, but we've seen an increase in the frequency and severity of weather systems since the climate crisis has gotten worse. And unfortunately, a lot of these things that we are talking about really do impact communities of color disproportionately to other places. Yeah, so I think that it's, again, just an important thing to really start to recognize the way in which each and every one of our privilege kind of connects back to this concept of climate change, climate justice. And then what can we do if we are fortunate enough to be in a place where our social determinants of health are not directly impacted by climate change and we're not victims of climate justice, then like, what can we do? How can we make sure that the impact we have is even greater because we have the ability to speak for people who might not be able to take the same kind of actions that we can take? Oh, I love that. I love how you just said that. And that's empowering, right? To think about, I don't have to think about this. And some people really do have to think about it. So what small things can I do? What could I do in my routine? What call, what small swaps could I do? And I know that this is a huge part of your life, Sonia. I mean, you are like the pinnacle person we could possibly have on here to talk about all the different things that you do. As a minimalist and having your low impact way of living, it's super intriguing and inspiring. And so I would love just for you to go there, give people the picture of kind of what your routines are like, the swaps you've made, what it would be like to live with you and kind of how you make this zero waste situation. I love that you asked that question. And so, yeah, I really kind of got into this when I discovered the concept of minimalism. Um, I, I discovered this idea of like living with less many years ago. And I was so intrigued by the concept because I'm the kind of person who is overwhelmed by messes. I do not do well if my space is not clean. I can't think straight if um, there are piles of papers in places or if I know that there are like dirty dishes on my kitchen counter. I have to deal with them before I can be productive, before I can get stuff done and before I really feel at ease and at peace. And so that way of being lent itself very well to this concept of minimalism. But I think that we hear that term minimalism and we think it's extreme, right? Like we see examples of people living with like two outfits and like, you know, nothing in their closets and nothing in their homes. And I kind of think about it as maybe living a little bit more consciously rather than minimally. Um, So I do consider myself a fairly minimal person, but I consider myself even more so than that, a conscious consumer. So when I started really getting into this whole concept, I started thinking about how good it felt to me to get rid of stuff and to not be encumbered by physical possessions. But of course, there are things that I need, right? So what I started doing was as soon as I finished using something up, I started researching what could I replace this with that would be 
maybe a more non-toxic option, maybe a lower impact option, maybe a compostable option, or maybe an option that lasts forever that I don't need to replace. And I just had so much fun starting to work on this project and starting to change all of the things that I had. And um, I have taken it pretty far <laughs> and um, I have gotten to a place where I am just really, really kind of proud of the collection of things that I've like kind of cultivated and the the different products that I'm using to ensure that the impact I have is as low as it can be. We hear this term zero waste a lot of the time. And I love that term. I love the idea and the intention behind it. But I think a lot of people get really freaked out by that. They get maybe kind of caught up in an all or nothing mindset when they hear the word zero. And so I prefer the term low impact. Um, and really low impact and minimalism have, have gone hand in hand for me. Very cool. I bet your place looks so tidy. I just keep thinking of Marie Kondo. And I actually love her system. And like she had this show and everything. If, if you're not familiar, she really likes to take what she has, see if it sparks joy. And if it doesn't, you figure out a way to get rid of it. And so I'm curious with that. So let's say you go through your closet. You just moved. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And thinking of, okay, I have clothes that I don't want to wear anymore. They don't spark joy or, you know, I'm not, I haven't worn them in the past six months. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Where do they go? Yes. So I am into this concept of mindful minimizing. And this is something that I've written about in my book um, that I think can be a really, really cool thing to do because it can help you get really clear on what your values are. I think when a lot of people start thinking about getting rid of stuff, they think like, they get overwhelmed and the easiest thing to do is just like throw everything away and start over, right? Or like get rid of everything, bring it all to goodwill and just like begin again and try to do better next time. And this is where the, the mindful part comes into the conversation because when you mindfully interact with all of your stuff and you mindfully minimize it, you're working towards discerning your values around your possessions. So you're working on discerning what's important to me to own. What do I need to have that's going to make me feel like me? And what do I want to, you know, engage with and interact with? What feels worth cleaning up to me? What feels worth taking care of to me? And when you start to recognize that, you can start to kind of be a more conscious consumer and a more mindful person. And so when I am personally getting rid of stuff, what I love to do is create different kind of piles or categories or sections of things um, which usually are like rehome, recycle, or use up, donate, kind of things like that. And then the smallest category is trash. Um, I try really hard to focus on producing the smallest amount of trash as possible, but it is an inevitability in getting rid of stuff. But I think that you can start getting really creative about thinking like, who else could use this? Could I donate this somewhere? Could I rehome this to somebody? Is there a recycling program for this thing that maybe isn't in my curbside recycling, but is something that I can recycle as a specialty item? And when you start asking questions like that, you can get a lot more conscious about getting rid of stuff. And it's it's more fun, I think, than just like taking a bunch of stuff in a random box and dropping it off at Goodwill. So finding places in your area that pick up things that you think is more eco-friendly than dropping things off at Goodwill. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the most friendly thing you could possibly do is use what you have, right? If you have something, using it up and making good use of it until it's done um, really is the, the most environmentally conscious thing that you can do. The second most environmentally conscious thing you can do would be rehoming something. And so for this, I would love to encourage everybody who's not already in one to join a buy nothing group on Facebook. Are you guys in one of those? No. Never heard of her. Oh buy nothing group. That well, sounds like I'm a group I need to be in. I'm in the like <laughs> garage sale groups in my area. So it's always like, Ooh, that place is having a garage sale or I put my stuff on there or we like buy, sell trade. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So super similar concept, but buy nothing is a gifting economy. And so what that means is that there's no exchange of money. There's no expectation of trading or exchanging. You, you can't do any of those things. And so what you can do in a buy nothing group is you can um, you can create an ask where you say, hey, I need this thing. Does anyone have it? 
You can give a gift where you can say, hey, I have this thing. Here are the details. Who wants it? And you can write gratitude, express gratitude for, you know, the interactions you've had with your asks and with your gifts. And it is incredible what you can rehome in a Facebook by nothing group. Like I have surprised myself so many times by posting things on there and saying like, does anyone have a use for this random thing? For example, I had a broken lampshade and it was a large, a large um, lampshade, probably 20 inches wide. And I was like, what on earth am I to do with this? I don't want to throw it away. I don't know how to recycle or upcycle this. And I'm, I'm not sure. So I posted a photo of it on there and said, does anyone have a use for this? And within like 20 minutes, someone responded and said that she could use it to protect a plant from rabbits in her yard. And I was like, cool. Right. So things like that, where like, there are people out there who are really creative with things and really looking for ways to upcycle or looking for ways to avoid buying things. And it's just incredible what you can get rid of and what kind of community you can cultivate when you connect with people through the power of just giving things away or asking for things that you need. That's awesome. What does upcycle mean? Ooh, it's like finding a new use for something. Okay. Like creating a new use for something that wasn't necessarily its originally intended use, but turning it into something even cooler, even better, um, and kind of working with what you have to make something new. I keep thinking of those like artsy people. They're like, ooh, I could make, like my friend Britt always, she's super environmentally friendly. She always takes things and makes them into something that you would never think. Like pieces of bark, she'll like put on her wall is like some type of artwork. It's really interesting. So that's very cool. I love that that idea. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're thinking about being overwhelmed by your stuff, remember, you know, that time old saying of like one person's trash is another Mm -hmm. person's treasure that could not be more true. And so I think before you throw something away, consider if somebody could take it off your hands and do something creative with it. Um, And also, Brooke, you mentioned like specialty recycling programs and whether that's a more eco-friendly thing to do. Often the answer is yes. Things like being able to recycle, you know, torn clothing, like fabric recycling, or being able to recycle bras or underwear or um what else? What electronics. Are there? Yes, absolutely. Electronics. There's so many different recycling programs out there for things that you would not even think could be recycled. Um, So if you're thinking of something and you're like, could this be recycled? A really great resource is TerraCycle. Um, And if you Google TerraCycle and the name of whatever it is that you're trying to recycle, chances are that there is a way in which they can break those things down and turn it into something new, which often is a, you know, a more environmentally friendly alternative to throwing things away. Another thing that's really cool about recycling programs is that a lot of electronic recycling programs employ people who are formerly incarcerated, and that's a challenging place to be if you're looking for a job, right? If you have a conviction on your record, it can be very, very difficult to find work following your sentence. And so being able to employ people and being able to um, recycle things that are hard to recycle and provide job opportunities for people who are formerly incarcerated is a really cool thing. And we're seeing that pop up with more and more recycling programs. That is so cool. And I'm sure everyone, maybe one person, I don't know. I didn't know that. (laughs) I'm, I'm curious. I feel like a lot of people have the argument of you know, all the recycling, it it goes to the same place anyways. Have you heard that argument? And what's your, what's, what's your stance on that? Like that it all ends up in a landfill. Mm -hmm. I think some of it probably does. Unfortunately, I do think that there are times where that happens. And I think that the most common time that that happens is when people don't recycle properly. So for example, if you are in a place like say the state fair or Disney or an airport or like somewhere that's like a really highly trafficked area where people are throwing things away, maybe there's a recycling bin and a trash bin right next to each other and someone doesn't know if the product can be recycled or not. And so they just toss it into the recycling, hoping that it can be. Mm -hmm. There's actually a name for this because it's such a common practice and the name is wish cycling. Mm -hmm. And so I totally do that. 
It happens. And it's always based on good intention, right? It's always like you want the thing to be able to be recycled. So you toss it in the recycling, hoping that it can be. But unfortunately, if you do that, sometimes the processing plants that sort recycling are not able to process certain things. Mm -hmm. And if too much gets in there that contaminates the batch, it means that they can't they can't process it, they can't sort it. And so they have to throw it away in a landfill. And that's a bummer, right? And it's it's a bummer too, because it comes from a lack of education. Mm-hmm. It comes from a lack of people knowing what can and cannot be recycled. Um, and so I think it's really important that we educate people on what can be recycled mm-hmm. and how recycling works and what happens to things when they are recycled, as opposed to what happens to things when they are thrown in a landfill. So yeah, Brooke, I do think that that probably does happen Mm -hmm. and it probably happens more often than we want it to. And so that leads me to the thing that I think is really powerful about this entire concept, which is the concept of refusing. So we've all probably heard of the three R's, like recycle, reuse, reduce. Mm -hmm. We all heard that if you're a nineties child, Mm -hmm. you can probably sing a little song about it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that there are six R's and I think that they are refuse, reduce, replace, reuse, rehome, and then recycle. If you think about that, it makes sense. Recycling should be the last step in the process, right? And recycling should always come before wish cycling. And I think that, you know, it's it's really just important to start thinking through the fact that like recycling is one option, but it does produce um, and it produces an output of energy, right? It mm-hmm. takes a lot of energy to recycle things. It's not the end all be all solution, certainly. It's just a better alternative to throwing things away. Yeah. And you said educate, which I think is super important because a lot of us don't know, myself included, like, can I recycle this? I don't know. I hope. Like, I'm a total wish cycler. Is there somewhere, uh, you know, some resource you have, which I'm sure you do, that clearly lays out what can be recycled, what can't? So that could be one step that people start taking today. Absolutely. Yes. So a couple of different resources that I can draw people to. One is your city's municipality. So if you Google the name of your city plus recycling rules, you're going to get typically like a one page PDF that shows you what can be recycled. It will list on there like these types of plastics numbers one, two, you know, whatever can be recycled. Um, And it will say things like whether juice cartons can be recycled or whether specific soup containers can be recycled. It will tell you what to do with aluminum versus steel versus all kinds of other things. So that's a really great resource is just to Google the name of your city plus recycling guidelines. And typically there are some really good resources out there that will show you exactly what you can and cannot recycle. And it changes from city to city. And so it's really important to recognize that if you are in a place that maybe doesn't have the same kind of recycling infrastructure as the place where you live, it's important to be mindful of what what that place does have access to so that you're not wish cycling or aspirationally recycling in another city. Okay. And I want to circle back to those six R's. So you had mm. rehome in there and refuse. What was the other one? So refuse, reduce, replace, reuse, rehome, recycle. Okay. Should we go through them? Yes. Okay. So refusing is about saying no to things. And this is really about the concept of like, if you never have it in your possession in the first place, then you don't have to figure out how to responsibly get rid of it. So examples of things that you can refuse would be things like plastic silverware. You don't have to take that when you get takeout, especially if you're getting takeout to eat at your house. You can ask for no plastic silverware. Um, Things like receipts. More and more places are not printing receipts. A really common thing people don't know is that you cannot recycle receipts. They are coated in a plastic. That means that they are not compatible with most recycling stations. And so it's really important to throw receipts away. Um, And think about how many receipts we get. It's a bummer to think about how much trash that's going to create. So if you start refusing receipts, that's a powerful way to just reduce what you even have to be responsible for in the first place. Um, Other things like Toothbrushes and floss from the dentist. A lot of people don't end up making use of those things and kind of have a big pile of them sitting around. Um, Things like freebies that you get from conferences or, you know, when someone tries to hand you a new pen or things like that, you can say no. 
to those things. So getting really confident and comfortable refusing things in the first place can be a really helpful way to just initially start to reduce your impact. I love that. Less is more. Mm -hmm. As as you mentioned earlier about the minimalistic life, I think it, it's effect so it has such an effect on our mental health of clutter of things and so to start going through these things it's spring everyone's on their spring cleaning uh grind and so to get rid of these things but to do it in a way that makes you feel good right to repurpose to rehome is such a beautiful idea of helping those in need and you actually know who they're going to versus dropping them off at goodwill and if you start now and you slowly start Think about how tidy and clean your space can be. And that's a direct, <laughs> that's a direct effect on our mental health. So I just want to circle that back to health of that's what I heard you say. Cause for the longest time I wanted a dopamine hit. I was swipe city, hit the Amazon button and working on my health. I've learned it's not the right way and less is more. That's a beautiful transition into the second R reduce reducing things like Amazon trips is a fantastic thing to focus on, right? Like this is really about reducing or intentionally using less. Um, So reducing the number of plastic bags that you use or reducing the amount of, um, you know, paper that you write on or reducing the consumption of meat that you eat or the number of packages that you order or the number of trips that you take to the store each week, things like that, that kind of allow you to tread more lightly and reduce a little bit that definitely ties in with the whole concept of, of being kind of mindfully minimalistic. Yeah. I'm curious what products, and I know you have them in your book and we're totally going to get everyone to get this book because it's amazing, but what are some of those products that you have bought once that you will now have forever? Like what are some of those swaps that you've made that you want to share with our listeners? I love this. Yes. Um, so you are like guiding me perfectly through these six R's because <laughs> you just brought me to replace, there you go. which is all about swapping high impact products with lower impact alternatives. So one of my favorite examples is my razor. I have this beautiful gold metal razor that is like a one and done lifelong razor. It cost me about $100 to buy the razor itself. And then it came with about 100 little blades, as well as a little tin that you put the blades in when the blades get dull. And those blades get dull after typically like three to six months. And then you just swap them for new blades. And um, at some point I will have to buy a new set of 100 blades, but it's been, I don't know, five years and I'm like a third of the way through. So um, that is absolutely one of my favorite swaps, one of my favorite replacements. I also think that um, toothpaste for me, that's been a really fun one, like reducing the amount of plastic in my toothbrushing routine has been really powerful. So I um, have swapped from a toothpaste product to a tab product. And so they're like little teeny tiny tabs that you bite down on, you get your toothbrush wet and you brush your teeth and they turn into toothpaste, but without the plastic packaging and without all of the things that, you know, make paste paste. So swapping things like that has been super fun. And what's cool about it too, is that um, as I've replaced these things, there's just, there's no trash, right? Like I bought the thing one time, Mm -hmm. it came in a cardboard box. I recycled the cardboard box. And then from there, it's just like, that's it. There, there is no packaging. There is no waste. There's no thing to deal with. Every few months I refill the little Um, glass jar of toothpaste tabs that I have, or like I mentioned, every so often I will replace the razor blade box that I have. And other than that, it's just like not a new thing that I'm bringing into my home. It's not something I need to shop for or think about. Those have been some of my favorite replacements. It's so fascinating. It's these things that we don't even know existed, but when you have someone in your circle, like Sonia, and we're so grateful that we have you, it can be, we can hear you say it and it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Right. It's like, Mm. oh, duh, that makes sense. It's one less thing I have to worry about. Why wouldn't I do that? It's going to help my health. It's going to help the earth. And then I'm going to be example for my kids and I'm going to help my kids get healthy. It's like a no brainer. Mm -hmm. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the next R? The next R is reusing. So this is kind of back to that concept of upcycling um, or finding a new use for something. It's about giving a second life to something instead of throwing it away. So for example, like sometimes you buy a pasta sauce in a jar and it's like a really nice jar. And at the end of the jar's life, you're like, 
I don't want to throw this away. I don't want to recycle this, but I don't know what else to do with it. Um, and there are like lots of great things that you can do with jars, right? Especially if you transition to a lifestyle where you are reusing a lot of things or where a lot of the things that you're buying are coming from the bulk section and you actually need containers to fill um, with bulk goods. So, you know, using using objects and giving them a second life and if you can't figure out a way to give them a second life, then rehoming them to someone else. So that's the next R, rehoming, which is all about making sure that the things that you get rid of are rehomed to the appropriate place. So whether that is a store like um, like a Goodwill or whether that's rehoming something to an individual person, it's making sure that the object is going to be used and loved and appreciated by somebody who needs it instead of just getting rid of it. And then last but not least is recycle. So all of these previous R's are all about diverting things from landfills, keeping things out of landfills and keeping things ultimately out of recycling plants to reduce the burden that's placed on recycling plants. But recycling is a beautiful last resort for an object that has reached the end of its life cycle and can't be reused or rehomed or anything. And so then it's our responsibility to make sure that it gets sent off to the proper place, whether that's curbside recycling or whether that's um, organics recycling or whether that's recycling in a specialty program for a product that isn't going to be accepted by your local pickup. Beautiful. So you mentioned the razor and these products. Where do you find them? How do you know that it is legit? Because nowadays marketing is so great. And I feel like that's what I've run into with these products is, is it really expensive and it has good marketing or is it legit? Mm, that's such a good question. Yes. So I like to use the algorithm of Instagram to my advantage, right? Like we all know it's out there, it's gonna advertise stuff to us. And so I have intentionally spent some time making sure that it's gonna advertise things to me that I actually wanna see. Um, there are a lot of green products, like you mentioned, that are advertised as green or mm -hmm. eco-friendly or non-toxic or whatever, that are just somebody selling something under the guise of it being good for the planet. Ultimately, we've got to be real here for a second. Producing anything new is not good for the planet. It doesn't matter how environmentally sustainable the product is. It's not good for anybody to be creating new things and using Earth's, the Earth's resources to do that. But it is an inevitability of us being alive and needing things in order to live our lives, right? And so I think it's really important to make sure that you're watching out for buzzwords that you're watching out to make sure that you're not a victim of greenwashing, which essentially refers to the idea of, you know, sort of a play on brainwashing on like convincing you that something is green or eco-friendly when like it's not. Um, and so it is really hard, Brooke, to discern what is a good product and what is not a good product. Um, I think that what I look for when I'm shopping for something new is a lot of times I find these things because Instagram suggests them to me and there's nothing wrong with that, but it is important that you take it one step further and really vet the product. So one thing you could look for would be an impact statement. Is the company like planting a tree for every purchase, but they're also seriously contributing to deforestation? That's an example of greenwashing. Or is the product, um, you know, something that they acknowledge, like this product is made in this way by these people who receive this kind of pay and work in these kinds of conditions and to offset the, you know, emissions we do X, Y, and Z. You know, a lot of companies that are really doing this right will have some sort of impact statement or some sort of mission statement or value statement around how they are engaging with the planet. Um, similarly, packaging is a really good thing to look out for. Like if something markets itself as green and eco-friendly, but it's like wrapped in plastic, that's kind of a sign that it's probably not really a great product. A lot of packaging is compostable these days, which is really, really cool to see. And so looking for products that are wrapped in compostable materials or reusable materials, or at the very least recyclable materials is definitely a good thing to look out for. And then also just making sure that you know who you're buying from, right? Like making sure that when you are purchasing a product that, that is marketed as something that's green, 
that you know where it's coming from. Like what country is this originating from and who is it made by? And are those people being treated well? And are the things that they're sourcing to create the product actually environmentally sound or not? So it can be really overwhelming to start looking for these things. Um, and so that's where I think like, let let the Instagram algorithm help you out. You know, go like a couple of things and see what else comes up. One of my favorite resources and really the only brand that I like feel very comfortable endorsing is Blue Land. Um, they are a very environmentally conscious company um, that is focused on cleaning supplies. And I have totally transformed my home with their cleaning supplies. But what I love about them is that their Instagram is all about teaching people great things about engaging with uh, sustainable swaps, engaging with backyard composting, engaging with taking small steps and, you know, little action steps that add up to create a really big impact. And so if you're looking for like the very first thing, maybe check that out and see what else the algorithm recommends to you once you start following them. Yeah, I love that idea. I think for me too, it was following people people's recommendation who I trust. All right. Like Mm -hmm. I know your integrity and the products you use are legit. So I'm going to follow you. Same thing for health resources or supplements, whatever it may be. Even our skincare line. Yeah. We follow Jessie Golden from the Golden Secrets and she's super passionate about the earth and like wants you to know where the products are coming from and the recyclable and that she does plant Mm -hmm. a tree and like you can see where it's going. And so I think it's nice, like you said, to find companies that you you actually know who's behind them, right. too. Yeah, there's the integrity of the company. I also, as you're speaking, what I'm thinking is when you live this way, when you buy this way, right, you're a conscious consumer, it forces you to slow down and not just buy to buy. <laughs> For me, you know, mm-hmm. it creates that pause that's needed to not just quick hit Amazon Go. It's like, do I really want this? Is this really worth the money? Is it really worth paying for the shipping? Do I know where my money's going to? Is it going to just, to your point, a landfill? Who The workers behind it, I think integrity just keeps standing out. Uh, they care about our well-being. We care about the company. It's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that you brought that up. And I think that like, The bad news about living in a capitalist society is that the burden of creating environmentally conscious and responsible um, products largely does fall on the consumer, right? Like we, as the consumer, have to demand these products in order to get them. But that's also the good news. The consumer in a capitalist and linear economy has so much power and can impact supply and demand really significantly. And I think it's always important to remember that the money that you spend has immense power. It has the power to change the world. We vote every single day with the money that we spend. And every dollar that you spend on a product is a vote for more of that product in the future. Um, Every dollar that you invest is a vote for more investments that look like that. And so we actually have a lot of power to decide who our money supports and what the future of our economy looks like. And I think that it's really cool to harness that power and start thinking about how much of a difference and an impact you can make just by buying toothpaste, right? Or like by um, buying new sheets or whatever it might be, really starting to think about the fact that you are demanding a more environmentally conscious economy and an economy that is paying people living wages and safe working conditions with every single dollar you spend. I think that's an incredibly powerful thing to reflect on and to, you know, remember as we start thinking about, you know, feeling hopeful about the change that we can make as individuals. Yeah. Full circle moment. <laughs> you, The actions you take today do matter where you spend your money. It does matter. And it's, making you feel better about the choices you're making, which I feel like in our society, that spending that it just, it affects our mental health so much. So I'd love for you to touch on that, Sonia, that connection between purchasing consumerism and mental health. Yeah, there's such a significant connection there. And I think like, I think we can go a few different ways with this conversation, right? Like there's the Um, there's the reason why it's happening in the first place. Like if someone does not feel good about themselves, 
our society really encourages the idea of spending, like mm. shopping, retail therapy, and, you know, buying um, happiness and kind of getting out of your, away from your problems and distracting yourself from, like, by buying something new. Um, that's a really dominant thought pattern in our society and in our culture. And it's a bummer because it doesn't actually ever solve the problem, right? Um, so there's certainly that cycle, but there's also the cycle of change, which is that individual actions collectively create group actions, which create business actions, which create policy actions, which in turn create individual actions and so on. And so I think when we think about mental health and how this really, um, is, is connected to this whole thing, it's like being mentally well and taking care of yourself well enough to know that you have power and that your purchases have power and recognizing that you don't necessarily need to purchase things to make yourself feel better. Like being a person who breaks that cycle is actually a really powerful thing to do. Yeah. I mean, I can speak from experience of that. When I was really sick, it was like, I can't eat. I can't drink. I can't go anywhere and hang out with friends because what they're doing is what I just listed. So what do I have to feel better? It's purchasing. It's buying things. Oh, I'll buy a new clothes because I'm not spending money on alcohol anymore. And it's such a vicious cycle because there is that moment of something new, something to look forward to. And we know as you're, if you're a regular listener, we love the brain and the brain loves new, but what it's really doing mm -hmm. is it's trying to hide that feeling of I'll feel better. I'll feel enough when I buy this item. And that is so false, but the brain does such a beautiful job of tricking us. <laughs> and so getting in that place where you don't believe that anymore, I think that's a hard, a hard transition to make. So I'm curious what you'd recommend people do to help with that, that shift. Yeah, you know, that's something that I definitely went through when I first started swapping for more sustainable products. Mm -hmm. I found that I had no reason to go to Target anymore. And I was like, uh, I like going to Target. <laughs> I kind of missed that. But like, I don't have to go there because all of the things that I was used to buying there are now things that I'm either reusing or no longer using or have found a sustainable alternative that lasts me a lot longer or things like that. And so it was definitely a shift for me to start like not shopping for fun, not going on errands for fun. Mm -hmm. um, and what it created for me was a lot of space to do other things that felt more meaningful and more impactful in my life. So you know, for example, um, having a lot more free time because I just don't have a lot of errands to run with my lower impact lifestyle means that I have more time to read or more time to exercise or more time to spend with friends. And so I think if I were talking to somebody who is brand new at this, um, first of all, when you are swapping products, there is a level of newness, right? Like there's definitely some novelty and you do get to kind of pick out something and it is fun, but it also means that you're picking out something that's going to last and that's going to be yours forever. And, um, that's more of an investment than, you know, something that's a single time use. So I think what I would say to someone who's brand new at this is to, to start paying attention to what you're getting out of consumerism, what you're getting out of shopping um, and if there's a way that you could substitute something else for that same emotional reaction. I also think about just being uncomfortable with something new. Like my family always had crust in the certain bottle and I don't want to switch to the tabs because that seems weird. Will it get us <laughs> clean? You know, and so it's like all those little things that the newness sometimes is just like really uncomfortable. It's like, mm -hmm. will I like it? Well, will it taste like I'm so used to this? My whole family does this. I'll be the black sheep, you know, and so there's those feelings too of, you know, weighing like what will the impact be? what will I create space for and just giving it the opportunity to see what it could do for your life or the environment. That's a beautiful perspective, Andrea. I think that's such a good call out. And I also think it's worth mentioning that every person is absolutely allowed to say, I'm not changing this, right? <laughs> like you can absolutely decide that you will make a hundred different swaps and change things about your lifestyle, but you're going to use Crest toothpaste till the end, right? <laughs> like if that's important to you and that speaks to your values and that feels comfortable to you, that's okay. 
Um, I call that a sustainability threshold, like being really clear on where I draw the line mm -hmm. and where I'm just like, Ugh, I'm not I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. Um, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that, like, this does not have to be about making one million sacrifices that make your life feel awful, right? This is about figuring out ways to just tread a little bit more lightly, be a little bit more mindful, be a little bit more intentional and produce less waste. Yeah. Something I keep thinking about too is the time piece, not having to run errands. As coaches, that's what we hear all day is I just wish I had more time. You know, I there's too many to do's. And so if you could create a little more space for yourself, how else could you use that time? It's such a beautiful call out. I, I love that. And it's also saving money in the long run, which is what we all want too, especially with where the economy is right now. When I was looking at these products, when I first started swapping, I'm like, these are so expensive. I don't have this money. But then you realize, oh, I'm going to have this a lot longer. What, what did I pay for being sick? What's the cost of my health? You know, so as you slowly make these changes, it's not as big of a, oh my gosh, you know, don't try and do this all at once. Uh, but I want to speak on the financial piece for a bit and hear your perspective on that, Sonia, of really how this does affect our financial well-being. Yeah, you just spoke to that so beautifully and calling out the fact that, yeah, the thing that you're buying might seem more expensive in the beginning. Like, I think people probably are a little bit like sticker shocked when they see $100 for a razor. But if that's the last razor you're buying and you're no longer having to go to Target and restock your razors every few months, you probably are going to come out ahead on that purchase in the end. So yes, the sticker shock can be significant in the beginning. But the other thing to consider is that oftentimes the things are more expensive because the people making it are being paid a fair wage, right? Or that they are socially responsible in the way that they are um, getting the resource from the planet or that they are... Um, you know, investing in certain technologies like solar or wind to power the production plants or things like that. So there is a little bit of that sticker shock that can come with purchasing things that are a little bit more sustainable, but oftentimes it pays off in spades in the long run. And that really goes back to that whole concept of like voting with your dollar, you know, and um, what kind of world do you want to live in? And what kinds of things do you want to vote for how can you use your purchasing power for good? To the question about financial wellness, I think this is another way in which environmentalism and our mental health are very, very linked together. One thing that I'm really passionate about when it comes to financial well-being is socially responsible investing, which is basically an investing strategy that um, helps to generate social change as well as financial returns. And so this is a values-based way of investing. A lot of investments are just, you know, it's like you put your money into your retirement account. You don't think about where it's going. You have no idea what that money is being used for. But the money that you're investing is being used by other people to advance a specific agenda. And so wouldn't it be great if you knew what that agenda was and if you made sure that you agreed with it? Um, so something that I'm really passionate about is making sure that people are aware of where their money is being invested. And you can do that on a website called fossilfreefunds.org, where you can check what your investments are in, in a bunch of different categories like fossil fuels and deforestation, um, but also things like tobacco, civilian firearms, the prison industrial complex, lots of different things like that. So being really clear on where your money is, what causes it's supporting and where it's going can be a really cool way to kind of get more empowered around your own purchasing power and around what your own money is doing. Um, and I think that, you know, when you think about voting for the kind of world that you want to live in, it's really important to discern what your personal values are and then make sure that you're putting your money where your mouth is. I love that you called that out. So I, badass. I didn't even know that existed. You know, the things that we don't know are out there that are so beautiful and powerful. And to our listeners, I just want to commend you for listening because the amount of information you just learned, hopefully you will rewind. Hopefully you had a notebook and a pen, not a notebook and a pen, because that might be wasteful. Maybe your computer, <laughs> <laughs> your phone. Yeah, I love it though. But there's, 
again the word power Mm -hmm. and i think too this like this is a way to build your self-confidence oh hell yeah right of like every move i make matters everything i do can make a difference and then the more mindful you are with where you're spending your money or what you're doing with you know where you're buying from or what you're doing with it you can just start to feel better about your choices like it's just so wonderful. I'm so happy that this is a passion of yours. Everything that you're passionate about is so cool, Sonia. <laughs> and Thank you. you wrote a book about this. And so we want to tell our listeners what your book is, where they can find it, uh, and then where they can find you to follow you too. Yeah, absolutely. So the book that I wrote is called Designing a Low Impact Lifestyle. And it's essentially sort of a practical guide to first building awareness around what your lifestyle is right now. But it's also about understanding the bigger picture of climate change and what we talked about in the beginning related to environmental injustices. Um, And then it's about transforming the intention that you have into action, reducing your impact overall, creating sustainable behavior change, and ultimately figuring out how to become a climate optimist yourself. And one of the things that I think is really important about the, the way that I wrote this book is that it is really about discerning self-awareness. It's about understanding what your own values are, understanding your own readiness for change, and getting really clear on what your part is. And so in that way, it starts off as kind of an individual journey, because I think that the more we cultivate a sense of self-awareness and a sense of impact as individuals, the more we can create a collective impact in our families, in our social circles, in our communities, and ultimately in the world. And so it really does start from the perspective of what's going on in your lifestyle, what are you doing right now, and how can you change that, while also always acknowledging and understanding the bigger picture. So it's kind of like halfway between a resource guide and a coaching workbook and a guided reflection. And it's um, available on Etsy. So you can find it on etsy.com slash shop slash Sonia Eklund. I love that. And what I keep thinking about is it's like the zero judgment way of approaching the topic because there's so much judgment around Mm -hmm. you. We judge ourselves. We judge other people. Are you composting? Are you recycling? What are you doing? Oh God. You know? Mm Right. And it's like, we, I think they're like, whether you admit it or not, we get a little self-conscious about how eco-friendly we are. Mm -hmm. And so I love that approach. And it's so clear that you're a health coach that, you know, like real change comes from within real change Mm -hmm. comes from when we're self-aware of what are our values? Like, and within the environment, like there are things that you are doing or not doing that reflect what's important to you. And so what a beautiful way to write a book. I'm so excited. And then on social media, where can people find you? Sonia Eklund is my username on Instagram. Awesome. We will, of course, plug all of that and the other resources you listed throughout the whole show. Thank you, Sonia. Mm -hmm. We love you. We are so grateful for you. This will definitely not be the end. It never is (laughs) because we need you in our lives and our (laughs) listeners' lives forever. So thank you for being you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. You make us and the world a better place. That is for sure, Sonia. All right. Yeah, you're welcome. The next, next up are the three gold stars. Sonia, would you please share yours for this Earth Day episode? Absolutely. So first up is ditch your all or nothing mindset. There's this quote that says, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. And I think this is so true. This speaks to everything we've just been talking about. You do not have to do this perfectly. You do not have to do this at 100%. You get to decide what your own low impact lifestyle looks like for you and what works for you and your family. So I'm a resource to show you some examples of what it could look like, but you get to decide what it's going to look like for you. So ditching your all or nothing mindset is certainly easier said than done. The way that we can put that into practice is just by creating momentum, picking one small thing and getting going and then allowing that to build on itself and making a a big difference by just taking super small steps one at a time. The next one is to do a trash audit. And this is where you literally look at your garbage and see if you can find any patterns in what you're throwing away. 
Um, and so starting to build awareness around what things you're constantly seeing in your trash can over and over again can help you recognize where you might be able to make some changes in your behavior and where you might be able to make some adjustments in the things you're buying or um, the products that you're bringing into your home or things like that. So then once you do build that piece of awareness, you can take teeny tiny little steps in the right direction to help change your behavior. And then last but not least, I would encourage everybody to join a buy nothing group. Use the power of your community to not only meet new people and like really become a part of the community that surrounds you. There's so much good that can come from, you know, knowing your neighbors, knowing the people down the street, but also it's just an incredible way to get rid of things that you can no longer use that somebody else can make use of. And it's also a beautiful way to get things that you need without having to spend any money. Awesome. I'm so excited to join a buy nothing group. <laughs> <laughs> Free things and emptying my house. Yes, I'm pumped. Okay, Sonia, next up, Unleashing Ivy, our rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yes. I have mine already. Okay, just from knowing Sonia, I know that she is a vegetarian and I know this plays into the environment. And so I would just like you to lightly touch on how being a vegetarian or just like reducing your amount of meat consumption can help the environment. I love this question. This was the topic of my thesis in my undergraduate um, degree in health. And it was 41 pages on this topic. So I could talk about this for a long time, but I'll keep it short and sweet. And I'll touch on two different things here. One is that this is an area where I sometimes have some judgment for myself because I choose to eat a vegetarian lifestyle instead of a vegan lifestyle. And I think some people listening to this might wonder why. Um, and this goes back to what I was talking about with Andrea, with the sustainability threshold, where you get to decide what works for you. You guys say that all the time. And this is so true when it comes to creating a low impact lifestyle and figuring out what that looks like and how that works in your own life. And so for me, having the flexibility of being able to eat dairy, cheese, butter, milk, yogurt, things like that, that works really well for me. I choose to eat vegan-ish most of the time, but having the flexibility of being able to eat dairy when I'm out or when I'm traveling or when I'm with friends has really allowed for a lot of flexibility in my own lifestyle. And so what I think is a beautiful term that I would encourage people to adopt is the term flexitarian. And that term refers to um, eating meat here and there, you know, maybe when you're traveling, when you're out with friends and family, when you're at a, a restaurant or something like that, but choosing to eat vegetarian a lot of the time reducing the amount of meat that you eat has incredible impacts um, in so many different ways, um, but definitely in terms of like water consumption and in terms of the amount of, of gas that's spent to transport food from place to place, not to mention, you know, what livestock eat, deforestation, so many different things. So figuring out a way to reduce your consumption of meat can be a beautiful way to adopt a slightly more low impact lifestyle. Flexitarian. God, I just keep learning more. I love it. <laughs> okay. And I want to know more about a specific topic that you touched on a little earlier, um, composting. This is something that is pretty new to me. I walked in a friend's house and I saw this cute little box. I'm like, what the heck is that? And she's like putting orange peels in it. So what is it? Why do we need to care? And how do we get started with that? I love this question. Yes. So Composting is definitely a very foreign concept to a lot of people. Most people think about compost and they think of like the smell of their trash can and mm -hmm. they immediately get super grossed out. And something that's really important to know about compost is that the reason that your trash smells bad is because it is organic compounds, food, mixed with inorganic compounds like plastic that create a bunch of different gases that make your food smell bad. So compost by itself should not actually smell bad. If you just have a bin of organic matter, like orange peels, coffee grounds, eggshells, uh, vegetable peels, things like that, just all by itself, it really shouldn't smell bad. That's not to say it's going to smell like delightful and awesome, but it's not going to smell like that really gross garbagey smell that you probably can conjure up. 
Um, and so this leads to an important point that a lot of people don't know, which is that food does not break down in landfills. People think that throwing away an apple core or throwing away something that's marked as biodegradable is like no problem because it will break down in the landfill, but it won't. And the reason for that is because in order for food or organic matter to break down, it needs exposure to a certain amount of oxygen. If it doesn't have exposure to oxygen, it creates off gases like methane, which makes it smell really bad and also which creates pretty serious greenhouse gas emissions um, that are not good for the planet. And so getting your organic matter separated from your inorganic matter is very, very important. Composting can look like a lot of different things. Um, one thing is you can Google the name of your city plus organics recycling and see if your city has a program. A lot of cities around the US are starting to have industrial composting programs that work just the same way as your trash pickup and your recycling pickup. Um, and if your city does not have that, sometimes it has drop-off locations. So you can keep your compost in your freezer in a compost bag and drive it to the compost drop-off location and put it there. Some farmers markets also have vendors who will buy compost from you or where you can drop it off and donate it because it's really, really wonderful when you can break compost down. Um, it, it creates very nutrient rich soil, which is excellent for people who are gardeners. And then last but not least, if none of those options are accessible to you, or if you're just like, I can't, I can't handle food, I don't wanna do this, um, there are lots of countertop composting options. So if you if you type into Google countertop composting, uh, you'll get lots of different options for things that essentially look like little ice buckets that mm -hmm. sit on your counter. You push a button and it turns it into soil. What? Wow. Super cool. Yeah. Oh, man, is your head just exploding with <laughs> all the information you have about everything? Um, no, because I take small steps. I don't do it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> How know. long have you been on this journey for? You know, I think I've probably been on this journey for my whole life. Um, I was fortunate to be raised in a vegetarian household. So I was born a vegetarian. My parents are vegetarians. My brothers are vegetarians. And so I think I've always had an awareness mm -hmm. of um, food and the impact that food has on the planet from a very, very young age. I was also raised to really respect trees. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't ever think about. Um, trees in in my worldview are very sacred. They're something that we need to protect. And they're something that, um, you know, you can't replace. You cannot get a 100 year old tree back. And so really being mindful and respectful of trees and the urban canopy is an incredibly important thing. And so I think I was fortunate enough to be raised with an awareness of that from like day one. But I, I have been on this journey for a long time and I continue to learn new things. I feel you. I get my mind blown every day by seeing new innovative products and new things that are out there. And by learning new stuff about this, there's just a whole world of information out there. I love it. You're one of those people that we want to just keep in our circle mm -hmm. because we're lifelong learners and uh, it's making the world a better place. Um, well, awesome. And Sonia, our last question for you. For Earth Day, in regards to the environment, what is one thing you wish you would have known sooner? One thing I wish I would have known sooner is that sustainability looks different for every single person. I think a lot of people look at me and they see that like I love lipstick and I love, um, you know, not camping <laughs> and I love nice things and like living in a pretty house and having a, a design aesthetic. And I think a lot of people can't understand how that fits in with being this person who like eats tofu and broccoli and loves trees. And I wish that I had known sooner that I and everybody else around me gets to define what my relationship with my low impact lifestyle looks like to me and that it's not my place to judge what anybody else's lifestyle looks like for them. What a great answer. How empowering. Mm -hmm. oh, I love it. And just one last piece of gold from you. Thank you before you share again for all of this information. We cannot wait for our listeners to get your book, for us to be texting you every day for the next however many years as we make these changes. So thank you in advance. You're going to be our little <laughs> environmentalist cheerleader. <laughs> I will be. I will cheer you on every step of the way. 
And something that we'll make available to your listeners is a low impact checklist. So for people who are starting to really think about wanting to swap products out and wanting to start and don't necessarily know how to start, this is a really helpful checklist that can um, help you gain some awareness about what things can be swapped and what things you might want to consider swapping. So we'll make sure that that's available to your listeners for Earth Day. Yes. Oh, thank you for that. All right. And last but not least, your piece of gold, Sonia, will you please share it? Yes. So this comes from Mary Hegler, who's a climate writer. And she says, you can either be overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem, or you can fall in love with the creativity of the solutions. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold.